Hello, this is Patrick from Borobui Comprehensive School. And in this video, I'm going to look at the development of cultural identity under William Cosgrave and Eamon de Valera. Now, to begin, what is cultural identity? Well, I suppose it what makes an Irish person an Irish person? What makes us unique, including our language, music, tradition, and as we'll see, uh, in Ireland's case, religion was very much tied up with it as well. Now, in terms of the Leaving Cert exam, the cultural identity question is very, very popular. So if we look at last year's question, 2019, uh, it was question two. What were the main events of the Eucharistic Congress 1932? And what was its significance for church and state? Now, I would not be a big fan of this particular kind of question, which is focused mainly on the case study. Um, it's actually the kind of question I'd ask my students to avoid, because I suppose you have to ask yourself, how many of you could actually write four and a half pages on any of the case studies across all the different topics? It's very, very hard to do. You know, I prefer broader kinds of questions. But I would imagine a lot of students did that question last year because it's a case study. And as we all know, case studies are very important. Now, unfortunately, some students, that's all they learn, you know, and of course, there are there are big problems if you if you do that. OK, now let's go on and have a look at 2018. Um, question four. During the period 1922 to 1949, how successful were attempts to make independent Ireland a Gaelic and ca uh, Catholic society? Um, now, I suppose, first of all, for any student who just covered the case study, and many do, um, this question would give them a lot of problems. Because if you look at the date parameters of the question, uh, it's very broad, from 1922 to 49. So if you only talk about the Eucharistic Congress, one event in 1932, um, you're not going to do very well in the in in the overall evaluation. OK, so as was what the Leaving Cert is testing here is your broader understanding of culture and identity, you know, and not just the case study. OK, um, I would be a bigger fan of these kinds of questions because they give the student great scope. Yes, you can talk about the Eucharistic Congress, but you can talk about other aspects as well. OK, let's keep going. Uh, 2017, question three. Uh, during the period 1922 to 1949, how do the 1932 Eucharistic Congress and are the state's language and education policies contribute to Irish identity? Uh, again, this would be my favourite kind of question. Again, any questions that have an and or an R in them, um, Students tend to do very well in them because it gives you lots of scope, right? Again, now you have to know your stuff, of course, but if you do, you will have plenty to say, plenty to write about, right? And there should be no fear of you um, not being able to write a full essay. Um, now, what interests me here is, with this question, is the emphasis only on the salt, okay? Uh, what was the, if they're only looking at what, what happened, what is happening in terms of cultural identity south of the border. Now, that interests me because, now, again, if you look at the exam trends going back through the years, now, it didn't come up in 2016, 15 or 14, because it was the DBQ question, didn't come up in 2013. But prior to that, uh, you have to go back to 2009 uh, and 2007, where they focused on cultural identity, North and South. And that's why in one of my future videos, I will have a look at cultural identity in the, in the North as well, because I think that is something, uh, it's due, you know, it hasn't come up in a long time, plus it's very doable, you know. So uh, that we'll cover that at a, at a later stage. So what is required of a student studying the cultural identity question well know your case study right the eucharistic congress 1932 i suppose in terms of study and revision this should be at the heart of what you're doing in preparation for this for this question plus i would also recommend the following you should also focus on irish language and culture education 
the impact of the Catholic Church plus be able to compare with cultural identity in Northern Ireland. As I said previously, I think this is probably due. Now, in this video, I'm going to go on now and have a look at Irish language and culture and education. So first up, Irish language and culture. Now, the background to this. Well, during the 19th century, Ireland had become increasingly anglicized. OK, again, I hope I get this point across here with this particular image, the Irish flag becoming more English and, and British. Now, I suppose if I was in class, I'd be asking students to think about this. Why did that happen? Why were Irish people abandoning their culture, things like their language, in favour of the English language and English customs? So if you want to maybe have a, a brief think about it there. Of course, any student that has done Ireland Topic 2, you know, movements for political and social change, uh, you, would, you would have covered this previously. Now, the reasons for this, I suppose the main reasons, were the Irish famine, um, the education system that was introduced in Ireland in the 19th century, uh, which put a big emphasis on learning the English language, right? For example, Irish wasn't even a subject on that curriculum. Plus, there was the importance of, of the English language in terms of business, law, um, etc. Right? You had to have English if you wanted to get ahead in the world. And as was, well, these things combined knocked the stuffing out of Irish culture, especially the language. Now, again, anyone that has done Ireland Topic 2 will know that in the late 1800s, uh, movements like the GA and the Gaelic League did a lot to stem this trend. You know, in other words, uh, things like Irish games, uh, the GA, uh, the Irish language became very popular. But English influence was still very strong. Now, we should know from our study of 1916 that many of the men involved in it, sorry, many of the men and women involved in it were members of both or either organisations. And I suppose there was a strong belief among them and many Irish people that if Ireland could become independent, it would lead to a further revival of Irish culture, especially the Irish language. So happy days. Now, I suppose this opportunity now arrived with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Finally, Ireland had an opportunity to grow and foster Irish culture, including the Irish language. So the state's founding fathers, the likes of William T. Cosgrave and Eamon de Valera, both strongly believed in the words of Padraig Pearce. He wanted an Ireland not free merely, but Gaelic as well. Okay, so I think that's a very important quote, well worth learning. The kind of Pierce wanted, it wasn't good enough that Ireland be free, it had to be Gaelic as well. So what did Irish governments do to promote the Irish language? Well, we'll start off with William T. Cosgrave and Cumann and Ail. They felt the best way to promote the Irish language was through the education system. Now, red alert here. As I said, often with the cultural identity question or the Eucharistic Congress question, if you want to call it that, they tie in education, right? Now, I'll be honest, I don't do a lot on the development of the Irish education system. I think few teachers do. So a little bit would suffice here, you know, and it would also impress. So what follows, uh, you can use or recycle for any cultural identity question that incorporates education, right? So if we look at this example here, uh, during the period 1922 to 49, how do the Eucharistic Congress and are the state's language and education policies contribute to Irish identity? So I think it would look very good, you know, 
to a marker if you can use the following material and there's not a lot of it you know you just go away and learn it and of course a lot of it is tied into the whole idea of promoting and fostering the Irish language so here goes how the education system was used to promote the Irish language and our cultural identity well a couple of obvious things like you know for example school books now began to be translated into Irish the Irish language was modernized. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, it was brought into the 20th century. New words were invented to keep up with modern trends, for example, in motoring and the sciences, you know, that um, Irish students, academics, no longer had to use the English terms. We now had Irish terms, uh, Irish vocabulary for, for, such, uh, for such occasions. It was also a back-to-time school for teachers. Um, Irish language training colleges were set up for Irish for teachers to improve their Irish. You know, I suppose when the Free State was established, you know, one third of Irish teach or national school teachers did not have an Irish language qualification. So that was set up to deal with that particular problem. Another measure Commonail and Cosgrave introduced was that grants were given to schools who taught all their subjects true Irish. 1928, Irish became a compulsory subject for the intermediate or intercert that I, that I would have said, uh, I suppose today what we call the junior cert. Uh, 1934, um, Fianna Fáil would make it compulsory for the leaving cert. And I'm sure a lot of you are studying Irish for the for the leaving cert this year as well as a, as, as a result. I'm glad to do so. Now, another measure they introduced were uh, the setting up of Irish departments were set up in all the universities around Ireland, for example, UCC and UCG. So if any of you decide to study Irish in those universities, um, that's where those Irish departments came, came from. Now, besides measures in education what other measures were introduced by common and ale and Fianna Fáil to encourage um, the Irish language so here goes bilingual road signs were introduced and I again when you're traveling the highways and byways of Ireland you know that's still the case you know uh, place names are both in English and in Irish uh, from 1925 Public servants such as teachers and Gardaí had to pass an Irish exam. Um, again, I suppose currency, the, the money in people's pockets, um, now had Irish terms. For example, the punt. And you also had phrasing like, again, if you look at these coins here, uh, pingin, the Irish penny. Uh, they were also on our, our coins. And I suppose the idea to to spread the use of the Irish language. No, I don't know, did many people take much notice of them, but they, they were on the coins anyway. Now, 1926, 2RN was set up, right? Our first national radio station. It's actually a pretty cool name for an Irish radio station. If you think about it, 2RN, 2ARN, 2ARN to Ireland, you know? So that was our first um, national radio station. Uh, set up by the Common and Ale government, and its programs put a big emphasis on Irish traditional music and also the Irish language. Now, in 1937, the Irish language got a huge boost from Eamon de Valera's Bunrock na Héireann, the Irish constitution, when it was introduced. Because in it, Article 8 recognised the Irish language as the national language and the first official language of the country. English was downgraded to the second official language. So, considering all the things we've seen done by Fianna Fáil and Cumnan Nail in promoting the Irish language, how successful were these policies? Now, I suppose it has to be said such measures preserve the language, but, there's always a but, I'm afraid both parties failed in increasing the
the number of Irish speakers. English, as you well know, is still our main spoken language. Now, why weren't such efforts, and there was a big effort put in to revive the Irish language, why weren't they successful? Well, I suppose they were greatly hampered by the following. I suppose continued immigration from Gaeltacht areas. You know, I suppose Gaeltacht areas, they tended to be in the poorer parts of the country. And I suppose young people living there, or, you know, or growing up there, you know, when there wasn't much of a future for them in their area, they, they immigrated, they left the area, and with them they took the, the language. And of course, they're going to places where they're going to need to speak English. There was also a reluctance at home by parents to speak or encourage their children to speak Irish. Plus, the stigmas of poverty and backwardness that were unfairly associated with our beautiful language. They were still there. And of course, that was a big impediment to the language uh, spreading and becoming more popular. So from early on, the Department of Education knew it was fighting a losing battle. A 1928 report said there was little progress and few pupils spoke the language outside of school hours. So, a bit of a bummer. However, if Ireland was not going to be an Irish-speaking country immediately, or even in the short term, those who set out to make Catholicism a key aspect of Irish identity will have considerably more success. Now, I suppose what I'm doing here now, if you haven't noticed, is I'm kind of switching gear. You know, I'm moving from the Irish language as a part of our cultural identity to something else, and that being the Catholic religion. Now, I suppose the best illustration of this, right, how embedded the Catholic faith would become in our identity is our case study. The 1932 Eucharistic Congress. The Congress would be a clear example of the duopoly of power developing between the Catholic Church and the Irish government. Now, I suppose a lot of you would be familiar with the term monopoly, you know, from business or the, or the game or whatever, like, you know. So I suppose and I, the idea of a monopoly is where one person has control. A duopoly, think of the word duo, meaning two, is where you have two people or two groups or two organizations having control. And I suppose that's going to be the case in Ireland, you know, and again, the word, remember it, again, it, it will impress duopoly. It's not something you use every day, but I think it's what develops in Ireland uh, between the government and the Catholic Church. Now, what happened in Ireland is very, very unusual, because at this point, we're talking about the early to mid 20th century, most European states' power is held only by the elected government. Church and state are separate. They keep out of each other's business. A great example of this would be France. If you think, look at what happened in France in the 1880s. In the 1880s, divorce was legalized, as was work on a Sunday. Um, schools and hospitals were taken over by the state. And um, this one now really interests me. Um, French armed forces were forbidden from participating in religious processions. Now, I suppose when we look at the Eucharistic Congress, 1932, we will see the Irish army playing a huge part in the different processions and celebrations that were organized to mark the Eucharistic Congress. Um, in France, 50 years previously, anything like that happening was banned, right? So, again, you can see the power of the Catholic Church and its influence in Ireland in the 1930s. And, of course, that's going to continue for a long, long time. So, as we'll see, and I suppose in my next video, Ireland was a very, very different case when it came to relations between church and state. The governments of Cosgrave and Dev will work hand in hand with the Catholic Church especially when it came to education, 
and the provision of schooling for, for Ireland's young people. Healthcare. Okay. A lot of Ireland's hospitals would be run by, by religious orders. Orphanages and mother and baby homes. Of course, we've heard a lot about these in recent years and the role the Catholic Church had played in those. And the role the Catholic Church had in legislation concerning divorce, contraception and censorship in this country. Um, as we'll see, you know, like when government made laws concerning these issues, they were very mindful of what of what the Catholic Church taught. Like, for example, I know for a fact, 1937, when de Valera was uh, drawing up his constitution, he would have consulted very much with the Catholic Church regarding what to put in and what to, to leave out. Now, he did consult with other religions, but I think his main discussions were with the Catholic Church. Okay, so we're up and running. Uh, this is well, this was my first video on the cultural identity question. And I suppose next time now we're going to move on and actually look at the Eucharistic Congress, the case study itself. Okay, so I hope this and all the other videos have helped to you. And um, as I've said before, stay safe and well and um, best luck with your study and revision. Okay, bye bye.